Hey everybody, I'm really excited about today's episode. I interviewed Katie Conley, and we had a really great conversation about building customer service experiences. Katie has a wide and deep range of experience from five-star hotel brands like the Shangri-La to her new leadership role at Saltbox, a five-star warehouse. We talked about the twists and turns of her career paths, and I so enjoyed learning from her in this conversation, and I think you will too. Without any further ado, here's my conversation with Katie Conley. All right. Welcome to the Building Thinkers podcast. Today, I am joined by my dear friend, Katie Conley, and we're going to talk today all things culture and team building and customer experience. And so I'm so glad that you agreed to come on. And I think this is going to be fun because we're like actual friends. Yes. It'll be fun. Okay. (laughs) So we're going to start with a little bit of um, how we know each other and if there's anything that's just kind of funny about how we're connected or how we met or anything from our, in this case, childhood. Freshman year of high school, we naturally formed this group of seven ladies who are all still friends today. We had different connections, brought the group together. Some of us were in school together. But yeah, that friendship, I think, has been like a huge part of all of our lives. And we still have a very active group chat and hang out at least once a year for our annual Christmas exchange. So I think something when I was thinking, trying to think back of funny things and there's, you know, a million <laughs> ridiculous things that happened <laughs> in that time. But one of the things that stuck out to me was even Stevens was a very popular show at the time. And everyone in my family referred to you as my friend, Ren from even Stevens. So <laughs> for those of you that don't remember that Nickelodeon, I think show that you'll have to go or Disney. I don't know. I think it was Disney. Go look it up. Tracy looked exactly like Ren from even Stevens. There I am. Ren, that's my claim to fame. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for agreeing to be on. And just a little bit of background. What what I'm trying to do here is it came to me as I was thinking about building thinkers. And you know, when I listen to other podcasts, when I read books, I'm kind of obsessed with learning. I love learning new things. And when I'm thinking about this, there are so many times in our different industries and businesses where things get overcomplicated. And I think many times from people's real experience in the world, we can learn so much from just the things that people have learned and we can make it simpler. So that's what I'm trying to do here in any industry and any space and kind of starting with friends and people in my community and learning from that. And I'm already so excited just reading through, we have a little notes document. Well, it's actually a worksheet for the podcast because I'm a nerd. <laughs> and so Katie has been diligently working on her worksheet a couple minutes prior to this. And this is an industry that's very different from my own. So I'm so excited to learn from you today. Let's start off with a little bit of what it is that you build. And then we'll get into a little bit of your story of how you got there. But starting right now, what is it that you're currently working on and building in your work world? I started working for a startup almost a year and a half ago called Saltbox. And Saltbox exists to solve the hardest parts of running an e-commerce business. And we're doing that through a human-centric model. Most players in the logistics industry are not about the human at the heart of it. And it makes it really challenging for people starting businesses to you know, receive pallets of inventory or to get a shipment out or to deal with USPS or UPS. So we are taking all of those stressors away from small to medium businesses and we're handling them so they can focus on the fun stuff. So the marketing, the creative process, designing product. And I think what's really cool and probably ties into our conversation today is that human centric piece. So it's not just a warehouse, but it's a five-star warehouse with staff that are eager to help you. So excited to talk more about that. Awesome. I love that. It's been really fun to watch alongside you as a friend, kind of that journey and hearing about Saltbox and the amazing things and the concept. You have a really interesting story too, of how you got there of kind of what was happening in like maybe the two years ish before that, maybe it was less than that, but can you talk to us a little bit about what you were doing and a little bit of your career prior And then we'll go from there. Referring back to our group of friends growing up, I loved planning and hosting. And if there was any sort of holiday, real or fake, that I could turn into a party, like that was what I wanted to do. If there was a theme, 
loved a good theme, still do. So hospitality was really a natural fit for me. It was also like members of my family were experienced in the hospitality industry. So I was around all of that growing up and decided to major in hospitality management. And through my degree at Purdue, I was able to do a six month internship living and working in a five star hotel in China. Who at 20 years old doesn't want to live in a five star hotel? So after working in a hotel overseas, I was like, oh man, I can't work in a hotel here in the States. It's not luxurious and <laughs> it's not exciting. And there's, you know, not celebrities or all these crazy people showing up. So I worked for a year in Chicago at the O'Hare Airport Marriott Hotel, which as I just explained, was not exciting at all. (laughs) And then had the opportunity to move overseas with the Shangri-La Hotel Group and live in China. And so at 23, I was like, yeah, I'll go live in China for a year. That sounds amazing. And that year quickly turned into almost four years in China. And I started guest relations. So my whole job was just to stand in the lobby and speak English to guests, English speaking guests that walked into the hotel. And I was like, how is this the only thing I'm supposed to be doing? Like just standing here, but it was, and it was so fun. I met a a lot of really cool people. And then that grew into working on the quality improvement team. And then through that, I was able to have the opportunity to go to the Maldives for six months and help get the quality improvements stood up at that property. Also probably had no clue where Maldives was on a map, but I knew that the hotel looked beautiful. So went there after three months, they asked me to stay, ended up staying for two years, which is a really long time to be on a remote island in the middle of nowhere. Then after that, I had the opportunity to transfer to our Abu Dhabi location which was a no brainer because one of the seven was living in Abu Dhabi at the time. And we coincidentally wound up living in the same apartment building. So that was really cool to have like a built-in best friend already living in Abu Dhabi. And then after two years of being in Abu Dhabi, I was in charge of quality and training. Now I have, you know, thousand employees that operate this massive complex in Abu Dhabi, but I felt like my career was kind of stalling. I was bored and I was kind of (laughs) frustrated with the very high demanding guests that would get really upset if the door wasn't opened for them. And I thought, you know, there's more important things happening in the world that I would like to be a part of. So I turned 30 and quit my job, much to everyone's shock and dismay. (laughs) Decided to move back home to Houston and moved in with my dad. And at 30, had no car, no job, no plan. Then course met my husband and (laughs) because you know who doesn't want to take on a (laughs) jobless carless planless I forgot about that timing that was right in that timing when you and Bobby met yeah okay I want to talk about this moment in time where you did make this decision to leave hospitality and you were working your way up and Katie's being really humble, but she was high up in the ranks, right? And so you got to hear a little bit of that with like thousands of employees and all of that doing big time stuff. I want to just pause for a moment there because I think a lot of people are really afraid in that moment to make that decision. And to me, it seems so brave that choice and that decision to go to trust your gut really is what I hear in that and what I remember and know that I also hear a lot of just like confidence in knowing, even though you didn't know how it would play out, I think you knew your skill set and your ability Mm -hmm. to figure things out that you'd land on your feet somewhere, no matter like the period of time that that might've taken. And so I want you to speak a little bit about what you think, like just reflect on that time. Now, looking back, like what you learned, what you might tell Katie in that moment now Anything around that, I think there's some learning there that's important. I make it sound a lot easier five years later, right? Oh, yeah, I just quit and moved back home. You know, I worked for the hotel group for eight years. And yes, my career had been progressing, but it felt like there was a lot of roadblocks coming up. There was nothing but positive feedback, but no real direction of like where that could go. And it was very like, why aren't you just satisfied with like where you are right now? Obviously, once I quit, that all changed. And they're like, how about this? How about this? And I was like, nope, my decision has been made, right? Because you don't feel valued or appreciated. I feel like they make it even worse when they offer things after the fact. Because it's not like they didn't know. I was very vocal, obviously, (laughs) about my frustrations. 
and that I wanted to be developed and I wanted to keep growing. Know your people and listen to your people for the leaders out there. (laughs) Or if there really is no opportunity right then, what are some stretch assignments you can do? What are different areas that person could get pulled into? I also wasn't totally clear like what the next step for me should be. So I was just very curious and and wanting to say, oh, do I want to continue in HR or do I want to learn to be the assistant general manager? What are opportunities that could help me figure out what I wanted to do next? Bringing clarity in career pathways or something, clarity on where people can go. And that's another structure that could be in place. Because that is in place in many, in many organizations where if you do this, then this, or some different options for personalized career pathways. It was also a little more frustrating because I was helping do that for everybody else in the hotel, mm-hmm. but nobody was like helping me do that. There were management development programs and I was leading this six week training to help people grow and to become first time managers. Mm-hmm. And part of the growth was, okay, if we don't have a role for you at this property, can we send you to an opening hotel for a month or six Mm -hmm. months? Can we swap you with another leader? So for example, the front office manager and the executive housekeeper switch roles Mm -hmm. so that they learn something different in the same hotel and everybody's committed to their growth. I think also too, probably could have benefited from a mentor type person to say, hey, let's step outside of the day-to-day and really talk about strengths and what Mm. opportunities there are out there. I think a lot of people are willing to maybe go when they know what's next, but is there any learning that you had with being willing to go, even though you didn't know what's next? I definitely wavered after I made the decision. I was like, oh man, was that the right decision? And it is really hard. We had a very lovely life, right? Like works in a five-star hotel. If I wanted a cappuccino, I could go to the lobby and this beautiful (laughs) cappuccino would be made for me. You know, living in Abu Dhabi was super easy relatively compared to the other places I lived and it was fun and I had an amazing group of friends there. And so saying goodbye to all of that was hard in the moment, but I also felt like, okay, the worst thing that could happen is in six months, I move back overseas and, you know, find another hotel job. There's hotels everywhere, right? I could work anywhere. It might not be an ideal scenario. I think there's something in that that I recognize as your friend is this confidence in knowing that you can figure it out. So you don't have to always know the next step because to your point, I could just go back there. But for a lot of people, they'd be so frozen in that moment in fear of, and so I think that that's a real strength that you have and just that confidence and willingness to try and learn and has allowed you to have a lot of really unique opportunities. I do love a plan. So, oh yes. (laughs) How did I, how did I manage to not have a plan? We can talk about Enneagram a different time, but yeah, I was a little surprised that wasn't in here. I know we, well, some people don't like it, so it's okay, but I'm going to continue to talk about it for the people that do. But Katie's a seven. She's a very quintessential seven. (laughs) And I think maybe that's a piece of it too. So this willingness, yes, party plan, but also willingness to go explore and have fun, that adventurous side of the seven. I want to shift a little bit to this idea of, okay, in all different industries, people overcomplicate things. This is going to be really fun because this is not my background or industry. So I really am excited to get to learn from you. And so when you think about, let's talk about customer service generally at first, what are some things that people overcomplicate? And it's like, if only people knew it's as simple as this, here are my bullets about customer service. Talk to us about that. So I think that people go through, you know, like, oh my gosh, we have to create this amazing off the wall, unique experience that somebody's never had before. We have to put gold flakes on the cappuccino. Like that's what's going to make them happy. I mean, it's cool at the time, but it's fleeting. But I think through all the training, all the quality improvement, all of the guest feedback that we have and what other people have analyzed, it really just boils down to treat each person as an individual and listen. What works for Tracy is not what works for me. We get excited about different things. When we go somewhere, we expect different service. So if you're designing this elaborate system or experience and it's not tailored to the person that you're doing it for, it's not going to, they're not going to care. It's not going to win them over. So yeah, to me, it's like literally listen. And it sounds so 
so so simple but very hard if we look at the world right now listening pausing being slow to talk right and don't assume don't make assumptions when people are checking into a hotel like if you're actually listening you might hear that they're there for a work conference that they're stressed about or they might be there for the first vacation they've taken with their family in two years and so those two people want very different things in their experience at the property, right? But if you're just designing one experience, you're going to miss one of those two people. So I think it is a lot more simple than people make it out to be. Okay. So listening, what else? Are there any other things? I've got a couple of other notes in here. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I thought, you know, what's really interesting and what was a struggle to teach was you can design everything perfectly, but something's always going to go wrong, right? That customer on their way to the hotel, their luggage is going to get lost. The hotel car service is going to be late because of a traffic jam or whatever. So people were so afraid of customers experience a problem, but mm -hmm. actually that's when the loyalty piece happens. So if you have an issue at a hotel or a restaurant or a with a company, as long as that company recovers that experience, you are more loyal to that co company than if you had never experienced a problem at all. And that is data. That is not just me making that up based on what I've seen, but that is factual data from all of the survey brands that people use to, to do guest engagement surveys. That is what it boils down to. So if you have had a bad experience, but the company or brand fixed it, you are more loyal than customers who never had a problem in the first place. That's really interesting because it makes me think about maybe companies that have a little bit of perfectionism. And so what you're speaking to here lets everybody let their shoulders down a little bit and like just have a true authentic experience with the customer. And mm -hmm. when something does go wrong, because it will, because we're humans in a human world and stuff breaks this response to it is so much more important than it never happening. And in fact, it brings it tighter together. This is a totally um, separate co concept, but I think it's actually connected here. We talk a lot in learning science about the need for struggle in order to learn certain concepts. Mm -hmm. Like if, if work is too easy, you don't really learn. It doesn't stay in long-term memory, right? I almost see the right. same thing that may be happening here. I have not researched this, but I'm seeing a connection here because your brain remembers the negative experience, but also the response to it. And then mm -hmm. and I can remember negative experiences from sixth grade more than the positive experiences there. So there, it, maybe part of it is that our brains do like to try to protect us, remember some of that, but then they tie it together in this, it was settled and resolved. And so I think that's really an interesting thing that's probably, it, it is simple, but it's not what you might naturally think is the right. case. An important part of all of that though is, so if there is an issue and you tell you know the restaurant manager and they're like, oh, sorry that happened. Let me go get my director of food and beverage. And then you have to tell the story again. Yeah. And they're like, oh, sorry, I can't. Let me go get my whoever you're just going to get more and more angry. And by the time you're just going to explode. So the real opportunity here is that the first person that you come into contact with, with your problem, that person has to own it, see it through and give you a resolution. And so what we talk about in the hotel world, or even now is like, how do we empower everybody in the company to feel like they can own the resolution? And so in the hotel world, it looked like we created a delegation of authority. So anything under $500, you didn't have to ask permission to do. You could just go ahead and do it. So if the, if the guests got to the hotel and their room wasn't ready, go treat them to an afternoon coffee in the lounge, right? If, you know, their meal was not great, comp it. Like, who cares? It's not worth them getting so frustrated, but you have the opportunity to really wow them by taking ownership in that moment. How we trained that was something called LEARN, and it stood for listen, empathize, apologize, react, notify. So your first assumption is, oh my gosh, sorry, Tracy, that happened. I'm so sorry. But actually, you're supposed to 
put yourself in that in their shoes and say, you know, Tr- Tracy, I'm really sorry that happened. I can imagine if I were you and I had just traveled, you know, 14 hours to get here, how frustrated I'd be. And here's what I'm going to do. And then handle the problem and then notify, you know, your boss or whoever needs to know what you did. You're empowered to handle it and make it right. <laughs> just do the thing. And I think in a lot of instances too, that is also a teachable moment for the employee, right? You might not agree with what they did, but they handled it and they did what they thought was best. And you can have that conversation then of, Hey, why did you do that? Oh, I understand why you did that. Let's talk about it. Blah, blah, blah. Here's what I would do next time type of thing. It it was making me think about my experience at Papado's when I was 16 and I was a hostess. And just the way that the Pappas family ran their restaurants and they really followed this principle throughout. I think the way that they handled similar situations, no questions asked, you know, handle it, cover it. And it was really powerful. You know, so many people really recognizing the brand, you know, because of the things that they did and just also a lot of their systems. And so I want to shift into some of these ideas around within the leadership roles. I think we're going to talk a little bit about culture for a moment because that one can get really tricky. It sounds really mushy in any kind of like culture comes up in work and education and all these different spaces. But let's talk about it for a moment from your perspective and what you've seen in building a culture where could people make this piece more simple and where do they maybe complicate it? (laughs) After I quit my job and had no clue what I was going to (laughs) do, I knew I wanted to do something impactful. Mm -hmm. And so I was lucky enough to get connected to the Houston food bank and they had a, the role of manager of organizational culture. And luckily the woman who hired me, she understood the value of having a hospitality background Mm -hmm. and it's not the same at all, but it is very similar that the Houston food bank has customers that they're serving. They're not five-star hotel guests, but they're still customers. What the food bank was trying to do at the time was provide an excellent experience to people at the worst time of their lives. They have a need for food and that's something that we were able to fulfill, but it still required them to come to, you know, a a food pantry, or we had a whole team of people helping sign up for benefits. And so we really wanted to provide an excellent experience to people on their worst day, be like empathetic and understand and give them the best experience that we, that we could. And so I was lucky that she saw that in my background and I was able to translate it into my role of culture at the food bank. And so having the title of culture is uh, very challenging because people look to you to fix the entire culture for 300 employees. No pressure. And you have to, yeah, no pressure. And so it was constantly reminding people up, down, side to side that culture is not the job of one person. I can help guide the direction. I can help say these things would have impact on the culture, but if it's not being enforced, encouraged, implemented by everyone top down side to side like then it's not going to work and there's going to be failures you said culture is not the responsibility of one person right it's not the job of one person Mm -hmm. so i want to build on that for a moment because i've seen that to be true as well in many different industries and this idea i I can't remember exactly where this definition came from but they were talking about culture as the things that we do over and over again that become so habitual we don't even think about it that that's when you know Mm -hmm. you really nailed a culture and so i just wanted to kind of build on that and see is is that connect to the same idea to you of it not being the job of one person? Because if you're like standing over there and saying, no, 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 we do it this way. No, 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 we do it this way. Then you're just redirecting behavior over and over again, which is what it's like in my household with my tiny humans. But if you built a <laughs> culture, then you know, which we're working on, then you know that when they, right. like with my kids, when they go and, and make the right choices at somebody else's house, and then I hear about it, we've maybe established a little bit more of a culture. And so I'm just kind of wondering if you see it that the same way. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and to to that example, you can't be everywhere they are all the time, hovering over like every decision they make. If you and Jeff aren't aligned at like the direction that you're going to have, then the tiny humans are going to have a very different experience of, oh, well, dad's culture is yes. And mom's culture is no. And I know who I'm going to go to 
when I want something. But if you're aligned, then they can't break you. If you already asked me, that's a rule in our household. If you already asked either adult and they said yes or no, that is the answer. And then I'm yelling, Jeff, say no. I already said no. (laughs) So this kind of goes back to the other piece of like creating memorable moments or great experiences. Something really horrible happened, right? Hurricane Harvey hit Houston and for days we couldn't leave our houses and like the need in the city quadrupled overnight, literally quadrupled overnight. And so when we could get back to the building and start working, we doubled in size. So now how do you take a culture and apply it to 500 people who are brand new day one? Wow. But I think it was such a shift for the whole organization that it actually was, ended up being a positive thing. When we looked back, we were all very connected as teammates, but also like genuinely interested in how each other was doing or who needed help or whose house got flooded and very worried about our team. But then also like, okay, we need this person here because the work they do is so impactful. So we stood up a daycare at the food bank for people to bring their kids. And that was not easy, obviously, but it was what we what we could do to provide immediate support to our team members for the next, I don't know, month, two months, we provided three meals a day. So you didn't have to worry about bringing your own lunch. We provided breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And those things, you know, seem relatively easy, but that was what our culture was. We wanted everybody to feel supported. We wanted everybody to value the work they were doing. We wanted everybody to be there because there was no days off. There was, I think, six weeks where everybody worked seven days a week, no questions asked. Like you were there, you didn't request a day off, but also you didn't want to request a day off because what we were doing was so necessary. And companies like HEB and all the sports teams really supported us. So we were able to create cool experiences for our team that had to be on site through all of this. But again, that was not something I could be doing myself. We had a daily leadership meeting with the CEO led. um, And those were where we talked about how are the donations coming along? How are we getting food out quickly? But also what is the pulse of the team and how can we make sure that they are rejuvenated and well-fed and excited to be here so that they can continue to deliver an amazing experience to the Houston community. Everything I did in that role was lock and step with the CEO. So if I didn't have his support, like it wasn't something that was going to happen. And he held his peers or his direct reports accountable to culture because it was super important to him and the direction the food bank was going. So it, it was a constant struggle to say, yes, culture is in my title, but I'm not the only person that can do it. Everyone on this team is responsible Oh, that's so incredible. Again, that's a story that as your friend, I knew generally, but to hear the behind the scenes of what was going on is really, really powerful and impactful to hear. And one thing I'm thinking that stands out to me was the decision to really support the needs of the team to ensure kind of like first things first, it's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Is anybody hungry? Does people have have childcare? It's basic needs met first. And from that place, everybody, it also stood out to me when you said nobody wanted to take a day off. Because what you were doing was so important, mm-hmm. so impactful. It was so clear. This has to get done. This is a moment in time that that we really need to respond. Our organization has been built to respond to this, but now has to respond in a totally different right. way than you were anticipating. And those shifts. So I hear a lot. And some takeaways that I have from that is like communication, clarity of communication and the communication pathways. And you talked about how you had this direct with the CEO. If he wasn't on board, that wasn't a pl- where a place you were going to go. And you have this note in here that I want to hit on that says, Brene Brown won't yes. work with organizations where HR doesn't report to the CEO. I did not know that. And I want to know, yes. tell me more about that. So I will caveat this by saying, I heard this. Okay. Second, secondhand <laughs> from someone at the food bank. <laughs> so we might need to fact check it, but okay, okay. I feel like it stands up. So yes, I think Everyone knows we love Brene Brown and it really speaks to the importance of HR, which is like now is shifting towards, you know, people, it's less human resources, but director of people operations. How do we support our people 
And if the CEO is not leading that, then it's not going to happen at the same level as it should, or the importance of that is not going to be elevated as highly as it should, right? So sometimes HR reports to finance. That doesn't make any sense. Sometimes it reports to like operation, like there's just all these weird Mm -hmm. places that it can report, but it is super important, I think, and especially in my experience that this role report to the CEO. The CEO should have his pulse or his or her pulse on what's happening with the people. Because if your people are unhappy, your customers are going to be unhappy. The experience is going to suck. People are going to quit. And so that, that needs to be set from the top. So I thought that was relevant to the culture piece. I know that this concept is so interconnected into culture, but let's talk more about building teams, building people and establishing that. As we think about building teams, what do people overcomplicate there? And where do you see it being more simple? So one of the things that happened after Hurricane Harvey was we doubled in size staff-wise overnight. And that meant that people got promoted who had Like they might've been really good at their job, but that doesn't mean that they're a great leader. And I think this is something that people get wrong all the time. You could be really good at executing on a task, but leading people is a whole different ballpark, like ballgame, ballpark. Um, And it's sometimes really sucks. Like it's hard and you're dealing with different personalities and different backgrounds and different expectations and different challenges in life. And so when all of these people got promoted, we realized a huge gap in the culture was they didn't know how to be great leaders. And so after things kind of settled down a bit, we worked with a really great woman in Houston named Judy Lee. And she and I worked together to develop this manager training. And the best part of it was we made everybody go through it. So the CEO was sitting in there alongside a first-time manager. And I think that had a huge impact on building that culture of like, no, we're in this together. We're figuring it out together. We're shifting mindsets together. Oh, love that. I want to hit on that point about the CEO being in there. And we've seen this a lot just in different industries, but this idea of everybody going through the same thing. If you're going to build a culture and then you're like, these five people need to go to the culture building training, but nobody else has been to it. Then it's kind of like, well, those five people are going to have a different culture than obviously. And that, that is, that should be very common sense. Right. But we have seen that as well to not always be the case when training, whether it's in education or in, you know, higher ed or in business. And you have groups of people that have different experiences. Everybody that's a part of the culture going through the same learning experiences as you Mm -hmm. recognize a need that needs to shift and no op, no opt out of this. Yes. No opting out is very important. So switching gears to Saltbox. So my my first job with Saltbox was to launch and run a 70,000 square foot warehouse with a hundred small businesses operating out of it. And so I, when I joined, it was a construction site and now it is full. There's a 30 person wait list of companies wanting to get into the space, which is amazing. Amazing. And the team, when I started was me and one person and now it is a team of 20 and it is crazy (laughs) but so cool and nobody like nobody in the company could have predicted that was going to happen because the product and service that we offer now didn't exist when we were opening Dallas and just for some context Dallas is the second warehouse so we have it more figured out now but still we were figuring things out we were learning from our small businesses that operate out of our space to, to really offer like product and service to them of what they are looking for. The team started out as one. It was a lot. Like I was figuring it out. We were, you know, like a typical warehouse worker has not been in like a luxurious warehouse. They've not been in a place where like they can sit down and have a coffee and like enjoy, like talk to their boss. Their boss like actually wants to know like what's going on and about their life because you know, they're used to like high production, high volume, a huge mind mindset shift to be like, no, we want to spend time talking to our members. We want you to know them on a first name basis. We want you to know their product. When you break it down to, to building a great team, what I really found is if, if I'm treating my team like I was my five-star hotel customers, like they just want to be heard, right? Mm. So I wanted to know like who they are, what their life story is, 
I tried to sit in our break room. It's both for members and employees. So I, in the beginning of the day, so I would sit in there, talk to everybody as they walked in, make sure that like, hey, like you don't have to rush to get to work. Like sit down and have a coffee, eat your breakfast, be a human, take the time that you need. It's not all about what are you doing every minute that you're on the clock, but having genuine interaction. Two last really important things. I, as a seven, like to celebrate everything, right? I remember one of the co-founders at Saltbox was like, well, Katie, what's something too small to celebrate? And I was like, I don't understand the question. Literally nothing. It's too small to celebrate. So we have a team member who would always come in. So we have like a six minute grace period till you're late. He would always come in at like 9.05, 9.03. Everybody knew it was just funny. And he showed up five minutes early one day and like we took a photo of him by the clock and shared it with everybody and posted it on the bulletin board. And everybody talks about it because it was so silly, mm. but it was worth celebrating of like, look, he's early. <laughs> I, I want to pause on this one for a minute. I hear in this a takeaway of being authentic and being authentic, present and celebratory as actually embedded into your culture, which maybe for somebody that's go, go, go production, production, production is like, but wait, these other systems, which I'm sure you have all that too. But I'm hearing that those actually allow your people to be, you know, good at their work and maybe lower turnover. Right. And to your point, be the present human beings and not be treated mm -hmm. in a way that they might be treated in a different company or in a different warehouse setting. Right. And so it might actually attract more talent in that area of your work, because I do get to sit down and have a coffee. My boss does, you know, want to know how it's going. It sounds to me I, I, I really unique for Saltbox and for what y'all are doing. It's just been really great. There's to that point too, like everybody on the team has different backgrounds and is in different places in life. And I've been empowered to go back to another topic from earlier to say like, if somebody needs a $50 Lyft gift card to get to work, just do it. Why would you overthink it? If somebody doesn't have lunch that day, get them a DoorDash. Just treat yeah. people as literally humans. How can you expect your team to work if they're, you know, worried about how they're going to get home? Take, again, Maslow's hierarchy. Take care of the basic needs and they'll take care of you. And it seems so obvious. <laughs> But yet so many people struggle with like these easy things that would make such a big impact um, right. on yeah. their team or their organization. It seems to me like people having different points of view is helpful on this for a team because there might be people that are really good at the efficiency systems or things like that. And some people that need to pause and be like, hey, also we're humans, let's have fun and put some of these systems in place that, that may, you know, help us. As the team grew, I hired an assistant manager who had worked in warehouse background. And she and I struggled at the beginning because she'd be like, well, they weren't on time. We have to write them up. And I'd be like, they ride the bus and the bus stop is a mile away. Who cares? They're still here. To your point, it was helpful to have somebody with a different point of view to like debate things with and say, if we can be flexible with them on their start time, I don't care. If they're here at nine or 9.30, what difference does it really make? I think I've successfully changed her mindset. And she now is on our recruiting team and able to talk to potential new employees about the flexibility in this role that also goes into the next point of like feedback as a gift. Mm. I appreciated her challenging me and I appreciated that she felt comfortable to say, wait, like it's causing chaos for the team. If, if this person's late, how can we work together? But if she had just, you know, not thought to tell me that she was frustrated, then like we wouldn't have been able to have these healthy discussions and come up with like creative solutions. So how I end all of my one-on-ones or team meetings or whatever is like, I want everyone here to, to give me some, for, so, some for, form of feedback, right? Like if you and I are having a one-on-one, -on -one, like the last point on it is like feedback for me. And if you don't have anything I will sit there and wait until you do, because I'm sure there's something I've done that's frustrated you or you're confused about or you're pissed off about. And if you don't tell me, like, it's just going to create a bigger and bigger wedge in between our relationship. And sometimes it sucks to hear it. And sometimes you're like, I had no clue I was doing that. And the other person feels uncomfortable, I guess, managing up or challenging their boss. But that's how like really great teams are built, right? Like if you don't have that honest conversation or that feedback loop, then, you know, 
you're, it's just going to cause problems down the road. And also you will feel better about the feedback I'm giving you. If you're also giving me feedback and knowing that, like, I want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so powerful to me. Cause I think that is definitely something that is challenging is not always um, a piece of a team culture. And I see so much exponential power for learning and growth as a learning nerd and always trying to improve myself and my own learning. I both love and hate feedback personally. Like I do love it when I can see this mindset, but it is such a mindset shift. I was reading something that was talking about, oh, this was from John Acuff. I love all the John Acuff books and, and his podcast and everything. And he was talking about Um, in his most recent book, Soundtracks, about shifting his mindset. And I think it was an editor, an author friend of his, oh, I'll have to go back and look at this. But the basic concept was instead of seeing the red writing of the editor on the manuscript as negative, he asked them to change it to green so it could feel like growth and just like the color shift yeah. in their mind help them to think That's about, awesome. um, okay, I'm growing, I'm learning and all of that. And so I think that this is a place where people can get very stuck in definitely in perfectionism and definitely in just kind of complacency is maybe the other place that people can get stuck there of like, it's good enough instead of um, continuing to kind of challenge the status quo and continuing to move forward. And I think about the exponential power that's in humans. That's one of the concepts of building thinkers, right? Is there's exponential power in all of us as humans to learn and grow. And if you don't like something in your life, like you can change it and you can grow and learn a new skill to like get a different job or opportunity. I know I'm saying that from a place of privilege. And so I don't take that for granted. So I think that that feedback as a gift is really resonating with me and it continues to push my own mindset. So the other thing that I think that I've learned across all the organizations I've worked in is if you want to build a team, you can't expect them to do anything that you wouldn't do yourself. Or you can't train someone to do something if you don't know how to do it, right? So what I thought was really cool, every hotel that I worked at, the first week of my training was spent in housekeeping. So we were cleaning rooms, stripping beds, scrubbing toilets. And was it the most fun of my life? Absolutely not. But it was really impactful to see, hey, this is a super critical job in the hotel world because those rooms aren't clean. You can't check anybody into their room. If you can't check anybody into their room, then they're going to be like mad in the lobby. So it just compounds on this very important job. So I would spend a week in housekeeping. At the food bank, we had a ride along program. So you went on, you spent the day in a 18 wheeler with a driver going to different sites so you could see food getting dropped off. And then as my, like, as my role in culture, like I went with, like, I went to a senior food pantry. I went to a kid's event. So I did all of these things to see how all of the roles played a part into the great organization. And one of the really cool things is I was able to help bring that to Saltbox with the manager for the day program. So this is super important to me, but we have a large central team that supports what we're doing at our locations that might not always know what's happening at our locations. So as part of the onboarding, they now come to a building and spend a day or two days doing the work. So they are the point of contact for the team. They are the point of contact for the drivers. They're moving pallet jacks around with, you know, 4,000 pound pallets of firewood on them. And so they're really getting into it, like sweating, (laughs) doing the sweat equity to to understand what happens at our location so that they can do their jobs better, right? Like I'm on the member experience team now. How can I create an experience for our members if I don't even understand what is happening at our location? So it seems really obvious to like, do do some of these types of programs, but it really is super impactful. And then you get to know the team that's doing the work alongside our members or alongside do the doing the work for the guests checking into the hotel. It's a win-win for everybody, right? Like you selfishly get to experience what happens. And then you also are building really impactful relationships with the team on the ground. So it's really cool to hear just all of the ways that your different twists and turns in your career path and in those opportunities, you did not take any of that learning for granted. And each time I hear it in the next 
um, learning and right. in the mess experience. And so it's so amazing to, you know, bring that into what you do now. Thank you so, so much. Okay. So where I want to go from here I'm now for kind of a little bit of fun, tell us about all the stuff you have from salt yeah. Box companies. One of the best things about working at salt Box is all of the small businesses that operate in our space. It is so cool. We are so lucky that 60% or more are female business owners. There's a huge proportion of immigrants and minority business owners operating out of Saltbox. So to me, that is so impactful. I love supporting small business. Okay, I'm wearing a Power Woman blazer. They operate out of our Dallas Saltbox warehouse. They're blazers for women. So they are beautifully lined and they have pockets, real pockets on the outside. And then the inside is lined by local artists. And so when you roll up your sleeves, you get a little pop of color and fun. Cute. So I have four of these blazers. (laughs) (laughs) Makes sense. Joy Creative Shop. Another female business owner who operates out of Saltbox in Dallas. So she does stationary notepads, customizable, um, all of that. So that's really fun because I love those types of things. This little flag is Imani Collective. They work with local artisans in Kenya. They provide them a living wage. It's not based on vol- like what they create, but they get a salary and they also provide childcare. So they're able to create like flags, pillows, um, all sorts of cute stuff for the home. And then I, this will be my last one, but my desk is co- covered in things not staged for this conversation, but Simfleaf. So they are eco-friendly, biodegradable wipes. And they also have a new cleaning product line, but the owner Femi is from Africa. He uh, immigrated to the US, started this company and every purchase gives back to his community by building toilets and providing the community with training on how to use them so that they have proper hygiene. But do you think the best way is if we link to Saltbox, are all the companies linked on Saltbox or no? They, okay, well, we'll put the individual we'll, links we'll have, in the yeah. show notes or in the bottom of the podcast description, whichever way yes. we decide to do all that. We'll get the links. And I think all of those people would be great future guests on this podcast. Oh, so, yes, I will go recruit. Okay. Go start recruiting. This is so fun. Okay. Tell us also about your background. So you're, you're in your home right now and what did Bobby do to that wall? Tell us about that. Well, first he built the desk that I'm operating on. This wall here is wood slats that he meticulously cut. Individual wood slats. Like how many individual wood slats are on that wall? Probably over a hundred. So he stapled them built the shelf and then spray painted them. And then we installed this beautiful Etsy wallpaper Love it. and the rest of the walls in the room are painted pink to match. That's so beautiful. So yeah, he's very handy. Let's talk about three book recommendations, three podcast recommendations. Yes. In no order, but in the most important order, Define Dish cookbooks are my favorite book right now. I am enjoying cooking my way through both of them. And Tracy and I share, I think we're the biggest chefs in our group of seven. So we enjoy sharing recipes and tweaks and what we tried and liked and what we would try next time. So I love both of her cookbooks. And also because I live in Dallas now, I'm determined to meet her and become yes. best Y'all, friends. I don't know why you're not friends yet. Like it's just a matter of time. Like, you know, all the things. So I don't know how I didn't talk about this book during our conversation, but Power of Moments by Chip and Dan Heath is really what I like refer refer back to. I love the book. I've read it a couple of times. It's really had an impact on my work, especially doing really cool things for employees and making it memorable. So I think like one of the important things to note is if you do a quarterly all hands meeting and everybody like begrudgingly comes to this all day thing where they have to learn the best way to make it impactful is to make them think that that's what's happening. And when they get there, 
add like a huge surprise element. Mm -hmm. So something we did at the food bank, because we all read this book was, it was our first one after Hurricane Harvey. So we had a red carpet there and the leadership team lined the red carpet and we like cheered people on as they came in. And then in the middle of the learning part, we like yelled beach ball and like threw beach balls from out of nowhere. And so all of these elements of surprise is really how you create powerful moments. It also has really good tips to onboarding a new employee to make it a really great experience. So would recommend that. And then the last book was The Checklist Manifesto. So this is also the most recent book I've read, which was over a year ago, which is embarrassing, but it's been really helpful at Saltbox. It's a startup. So we're creating all of these things from scratch. Mm -hmm. What we keep referring back to is like making it a checklist so that Mm -hmm. everybody knows like where in the process it is. It's easy to train on. It's easy to hand over to somebody new because it's very clearly outlined of what the process looks like. Is that one workflow specific or industry specific? The checklist manifesto? I haven't read that one. I would say not industry specific. It's just how to, how to get things right. So probably more work related than like life, but yeah, could be good for the kids too. Oh yeah. After school, yeah. here's the process. Oh, we, got, we have it. We have a morning routine and evening routine with pictures. <laughs> this is what it looks there like. There you go. Pack your backpack. Yeah. <laughs> this Box is what actually looks like. <laughs> Socks and shoes. Um, I did that in my classroom too. I had a picture of what, like, this is what it looks like to have a desk that is like organized and ready to go. This is what it, but my kids love doing, this is what the non-example was. So we would take a picture of that and then they throw everything everywhere. They thought it was so fun to take those non-example pictures. Right. Well, ironically, we, like, we use photos too. So like, this is how the cafe should be set up. This is what a warehouse suite looks like. So See, there's, there's overlap in all the countries. That's why I'm so excited about these conversations because yeah. it, there, there's so much, it seems like tangential or whatever, but it, it, there's overlap and then it can push your thinking in a new way to be in a totally different industry talking about something. It's made me have so many connections. So I love that. Okay. And for the podcasters out there, what are some of your favorite podcasts? I love anything Brene Brown. I mean, I feel like that's such a cliche answer, but it's true. And then my favorite podcast, not work-related, but probably some things that are, you could, you know, apply, um, is Esther Perel, Where Should We Begin? Esther Perel is amazing. She has great books too. But the podcast is a recorded session of a couple's first couple's therapy. And like, you never hear from them again, but you get to listen to her coach and guide them through their first therapy Mm -hmm. session together. And I think it is like so cool to be a fly on the wall also like I'm very curious to see like how they turn out but I I've gleaned a lot of useful information into my life and relationships so. and she has a work one now too have you listened to that one I listened to that mm-hmm. one times. yeah yes I'm a big fan of hers love it and then my third one like literally 20 minutes on the way to work is what a day so quick lighthearted overview of what's happening in the world Let's do, okay, let's, let's skip to the bottom of where can people find you? What kind of things are you interested in people reaching out to you about anything? Sure. So if you're a small business owner, no, um, yes, or no, just say that, yeah, say that. small business owner or literally anything. I love building. I could talk to a wall. So I love talking to people. I love meeting new people, building connections and community. And I love introducing people in my community to each other that I think would like have good partnership or good relationships. So I'm happy to talk to anyone about anything. And I guess, I don't know, I'm on LinkedIn, Katie Conley, Instagram. Yes. Okay. So Katie Conley's (laughs) preferred social channels are LinkedIn for conversations. Instagram, Katie Mick Conley. Thanks so much for listening to the Building Thinkers podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends. And please leave a podcast rating and review. That helps more listeners find us in the world of podcasting algorithms. You can find out more about my instructional design work at www.buildingthinkers.com. Thanks again for tuning in, and I'll see you all in the next episode. And remember, there's no limit to what you can learn. 